Hey, what's up, everybody? You're listening to Raw with Marty Gallagher, J.P. Bryce, and Jim Steele on ICTV. Today we're discussing a recent article Mar Marty wrote on Kem Patera called Chasing mm -hmm. Kem Patera. Uh, this is a Marty musing that begins back in 1969 and describes a period of Ken Patera near misses that spans from Oregon to where they finally meet up in West Virginia. Um, I wanted to discuss this not only um, because it's an interesting story, but Marty did a hell of a job writing writing this, and uh, you'll see it when you go to the site. Go to Iron Company, go to the article, article section, and you'll see both parts, one and two, of Chasing Ken Patera. It's a great article. All right, so Marty, first off, who was, <clears throat> who is, actually, I should say, who is Ken Patera? He's still alive. He's still alive? Yeah. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I believe he is. Yes, is sir. It? Right. Uh, well... Glad you asked. Uh, the, uh, the genesis for this whole thing was one of the, uh, one of my uh, quirks is, is I have this stack of like ancient, um, you know, like muscle builder and strength and health and muscular development and Iron Man magazines. Yeah. Periodically, I'll just whip one out and I'll just go back through it. And these are uh, these are like all pre uh, this is like old stuff. So I happened to pull one out, uh, Strength and Health from November of 1972. And I was just kind of, you know, looking through this thing. And all of a sudden I get to page 33. And they're talking about, and again, this is in 1972, how Ken Patera at the pre-Olympic competition before this is before the 72 olympics which i believe there were they were in october uh this was in july and july 23rd and there it's a photo essay of ken and in this one competition he broke all four of the heavyweight records in the press the snatch the clean and jerk and the total boom and on, uh, he's weighing 320. He's looking tight as hell. And first he starts off with the 505 strict as hell overhead press. I mean, the guy is barely laying back uh, doing this thing. Then he follows up with, he crushes the American record in the snatch with 386. Jimmy, this thing this thing looks like a power snatch. We'll, we'll get the photos up online. Yeah, uh, you know, at Iron Company. I swear to God, he's a, his thighs are at parallel when he's catching this thing. Yeah. So he ends up with a again another five oh five. You know, I'm putting my fingers up in the air, clean and jerk. Basically, it's a push press with five oh five. Now. Wow. Uh, so he totals, uh, what was his total? 1394, 1395. 97. 30, yeah, so on, now, as luck would have it in the same issue of Strength and Health, uh, that was on page 33. On page 32, they had the listing of the then world records. Okay. So at the time, Patera posted those lifts, right? The press record was 521 by Alexiev. Okay, so Kenny was 16 pounds behind Alexiev. Wow. In the snatch, the world record was 396 by Alexiev. Ken was only 10 pounds back in the snatch. Okay, in the clean and jerk, the record was 523. Ken was 18 pounds back. So he was 44 pounds back of the greatest Olympic weightlifter of all time and yeah, nobody ever does nobody ever talks about that that's crazy and nobody yeah. ever talks about the fact that he was the first man to stand up with 500 and and, and that was in december of 1969 yeah now did he try to, to jerk on that and miss uh it? yeah he did he threw it up about to his head height but yeah. anyway that's why ken patera is great now what happened so what happened so he's within spitting distance of the greatest Olympic lifter of all time. And Ken's only been in the game for three years. Yeah, yeah. 
right? Well, his, look at his lineage, like you point out in the article. Uh, okay, we're going to get into that. But wait, what happened? What happened? What happened? What happened in the time between the July pre-Olympic tryouts and the 72 games in October? July to October, what happened? What there was happened? The, the worst Olympics of all time. That was the Munich Olympics. Uh, oh, they, with the terrorists. They gunned down, at, you know, mm. the... The Jews were slaughtered by the Black September. Uh, well, you know, would that uh, like throw a pat? So what happened to Ken? First, he had a substandard press. Ken needed a world record press. Between July and October, you know what he should have done, Jim? What's that? What would you have done? I would have added 10 pounds of body weight. I'm a super heavyweight. Uh, okay. Why not? What was, he, what was he weighing in Munich? 320, and he looked tight. When he did the 1394... He needed lasagna in the mornings, what he needed. Uh, yes. Ex- yeah. <laughs> Buddy, let's go, su- let's go sumo. Yeah. Let's go sumo. You're going for the Olympic gold medal. Let's push your body weight up to 335. Exactly. Right? And, and why not? Win. And, and we got one win. Yeah. Right? And let's press 526 and let's snatch 402 and let's... Clean and jerk, five twenty six, and beat Alexiev's ass. Yeah. What, what was uh, what was his body weight at the time, Alexiev? Three twenty. Three. Oh, Alexiev. Uh, he was big. He was big and sloppy. But Alexiev was he was a superior technician. He was the first one to admit. He said Pitera was so much stronger than me. He said Pitera is a bull. Right. Yeah, yeah. He says I'm a ballet dancer, in comparison. But who's the smart one? Yeah. Who was on the? Yeah. So what happened at the Olympics? He had a substandard press. He Kenny bombed out in the snatches. Three misses. Boom. End of Olympic. End of weightlifting. End of everything. Then he goes into wrestling. See you later. Yeah. Right. You were trying to say still Olympic weightlifting. No, he just said I don't need this. No, I'm saying you were trying when you were trying to find him. Oh, 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 that was earlier. That was in 69. He was on the way up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, now, okay, that's the preamble. Now we pick the story up. Yeah, I had, <laughs> yeah, I was in Washington, D.C. and looking to get out. A commune. And, yeah, I lived in a commune at 1724 S Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C. It's a four-story four walk-up. We had fifty. <laughs> Fifteen people, uh, seven guys, eight women. Uh, everyone was expected to sleep on the third floor, which was a communal sleeping area. Nice. Uh, my gig was I cooked. I could make hamburger and pasta go far, and they liked it, so they loved me. Why do I have the feeling that you're when you're in that commune, you're like you're in it, but you're also stepping back and thinking everything's going to be a book or a story when you, later on and you're observing. Well, they were all, these were all elite college. These were, uh, the commune that I was in was the Corcoran Art Institute, uh, the artist commune. And so they had money. Yeah. Oh, but, but all the communes had money. Had money. They, yeah, they they all, guys, you didn't have any money. No, but, they, but, but what they did is they sponsored the elite within the commune felt... Um, morally obligated to have some lumpen proletariat yeah how street, much has america street, street, changed street urchins in so get basically myself and another guy named ray i won't mention his last name yeah he's we, got great we stories, were, ray. ray uh ray was uh uh ray was the son of a stripper from baltimore <laughs> Block, from the block. From, from the block, yeah. And he was your friend? Ray was my buddy, baby. What a surprise. Ray was, yeah. And Ray was, Ray was 17 years old when he was in the commune in wow. D.C. He hitchhiked with his little 13-year-old girlfriend. Anyway, we won't get into all that. So like, we like spent, it. yeah, everything in D.C. Because we were there from, we were, uh, I was there from like 68, 69, and that's when all the Nixon inauguration, you know, all that stuff. Dude, Hunter S. Thompson was right there. You didn't even know it. He was right down the street from you. Hey, listen, buddy. I can tell Hunter S. Thompson some stories. We had 12 communes within a 10-block area, probably, I don't know, 700 people. 
Yeah. Uh, and it was a party every night somewhere, you know, with the, you'd have a Washington Prefest, uh, free press commune, an SDS commune, uh, whatever, Herbert Marcuse commune, uh, you know, anyway, uh, yeah. a microbiotic commune, on and on and on. Uh, but the point being is that the street guys like myself, yeah. Uh, you know, we made out very well in that community because, you know, the competition tended to be, <laughs> yeah. feet, you know, the spindly. Feet, they um, were spindly, lo- spindly uh, flower holders. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we had good contrast. Let's just say yeah. that. Yeah. Like Hell's Angels at a Boy Scout convention. Right, right. So why were so why you guys get sick of the the DC scene? There's too many. Yeah, the hard drugs, the guns, the heroin everywhere. You know the riots. I like you know, and we we start when you start liking rioting. You know, yeah, you were a rioter. You were a rioter. Yeah, I found out. and a. Um, <laughs> Who gassed you, by the way, at that riot? Oh, that was that was so cool. That. So many years, many years later, we're, you know, at uh, Mark Chalet's gym and Mark's dad was Buck Chalet and Buck was a big time heavy hitter on the D.C. police force for like 20 years. I think he I don't know if he I don't know if he was the the big boss, but if he wasn't, he was like number two or number three. And at the time, he made his bones by dealing with protesters in the late 60s because every week washington is getting hit with some kind of protest right you guys weren't even born then were you no uh, yeah. Seven. Seven. yeah 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 this yeah, you, remember, this uh, you, we might as well be talking about the civil no no War. i remember when nixon got on a helicopter <laughs> <laughs> anyway 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 there, there was a lot of uh heavy duty uh civil insurrection going on and we were in the midst of that so when we got the opportunity to leave, you know, we took it. And essentially, I had uh, become good friends. Uh, we worked at Sidney Kramer Books, which is a radical bookstore down on 14th Street. And uh, he and I were the like the, the basement trolls. And, uh, you know, we'd take the incoming shipments of the, you know, whatever the current radical leftist thought was and you know they put these books up there and it was you know it was it, it was an interesting lifestyle but uh the the opposite end of it was it was um uh, you know too much partying right yeah, yeah. yeah well, you know you're gonna burn out you're gonna burn out and, and <clears throat> too much easy access to you know hard stuff and it's just you know it's just yeah but you had buck chalet on your trail oh oh yeah yeah, yeah. don't let me stray from that so buck got uh he was on the opposite end of the specter uh one of the particular demonstrations was in dupont circle that was our neighborhood we were uh our our little commune row house was five blocks off dupont circle so when uh the demonstrators were going to come down DuPont Circle down Massachusetts Avenue. We said, well, we're certainly going to be a part of that. And uh, at that time, they were, had uh, pretensions about uh, they wanted to get more and more violent. They felt that the uh, the nonviolent Martin Luther King approach wasn't working, so they wanted to act out a little more. Yeah. So we were like, sure, we'd help them do that. If they wanted to act out, we could help them act out. <laughs> right. Particularly when we were had uh, our fuel of choice in those days was cheap ass Thunderbird wine because you could get like a gallon for a dollar ninety eight. You pass it around eight guys, and they had these little Benzedrine tablets, and you take those and you turn into like a frothing goon, <laughs> right? And then be with a bunch of college kids and it was only natural to act out and you know that's one thing led to another and someone allegedly threw a brick through a window of the Chase Manhattan Bank and that was all that Buck Chalet and the boys needed who were strategically aligned on the rooftops 
<clears throat> and they blasted everyone with like a hundred rounds of CS gas. How did that taste? How did that taste? Uh, uh, Ray and I didn't know because we knew how to get the hell out of there. We hopped on a dumpster and over a barbed wire fence and we were gone. And we just heard their screams and moans and, you know, and Buck said, oh, yeah, we gave him a bunch of wood shampoos that day. I said, what's a wood shampoo? Right? <laughs> it's a Philly club on the head. I said, oh, my God. He said, ah, it was one of the greatest days of my life. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. I said, well, it's actually my buddy Ray threw the brick. He said, oh, oh, he said I'd like to buy him some drinks or 10. But, but, Marty, you were just hanging with Chalet's dad, and you guys get into this conversation, and yeah. you guys come to the conclusion that you were both there the same day. You were a rioter, and he was the one that was gassing you guys. You guys must have been. Correct. Yeah, you guys must have been amazed at that. It was synchronicity. Yeah. <laughs> as as C.K. Young would say. Yeah. So we had to leave. So we got out. And uh, <clears throat> my buddy Ray, he took off for Europe. He got a a plum job as, I don't know, some, I don't know, mechanic or some shit in a tramp steamer headed for Europe that took so 70, 72 days and landed in Marseille's. <laughs> Right, and he didn't speak any French or anything, and he ended up spending two I years. Didn't really care, they would just go, man. You didn't <laughs> care. You he, were just going. You were leaving. Yeah, he, he, and you were he, able to do it on, yes. on a lot of money. You didn't have to have a lot of money wow. to do that. You know, when when you get to this part, but when you when you found that house to rent, you didn't have a freaking job. No, I mean, but you knew you could find a job. It wouldn't be a problem. Well, actually, I, I knew Del Rio could find a job. Okay. <laughs> You're going back to the house. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I jumped ahead. I was like a man whore for him. I said, all right, buddy, you let me cook and I'll clean and, you know, we'll have some really good grub. Like a geisha. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, get it right. You know, the, one, one thing that you didn't touch on, I think, because of space was the stories going from D.C. to Portland. Oh, oh my God. There's got to be. I mean, you know, there's got to be a million stories about. I what have happened? a I have a feeling he left a lot of the illegal stuff out. Yeah. Said, you know what? Let That's me just let me just blow back. through that part, right? Well, again, you know, I, don't, I, mean, it's just, I, I don't know if we don't we, we don't want to necessarily sensationalize anything. Yeah, we don't want right. to incriminate Marty. No. Uh, <laughs> so what did you guys do? Did you sleep in the in the van, or what did you do? Well, uh, first off, we got an invitation to to come to Portland, Oregon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, by this uh, this gal named D. I won't say her last name, but she was a. I had met her. She had been on the DC scene for a while. My, my buddy Del Rio. He was an interesting dude. He had his father had a high ranking job. I think it was in the Department of agriculture and he'd gone to Princeton and he was like the number two man in the department of agriculture and Del Rio had been groomed for success and he freaked out uh, and joined the Marine Corps and gone to Vietnam and become a force recon Marine. Yeah. A Bush Marine. He did three 13 month tours he got he got a Purple Heart and a bunch of medals at the Battle of Way in 1968. Mm -hmm. And then he moved back to D.C., went to Antioch <clears throat> for a couple of semesters. And uh, he didn't take to that, so he came to D.C. I met him also at the Sidney Kramer Radical Bookstore. <laughs> and so he said, hey, man, he said, my uh, girlfriend left would you split my apartment with me? So I moved into his apartment. We had a beautiful apartment right off P Street. And I said, sure. He said, I only want a hundred bucks a month. I said, well, I don't have it. He said, well, don't worry about it. He said, yeah, we just, you're good for it. He said, can you cook? I said, oh man. I said, you, I said, I'm your bitch. So <laughs> we went on from there and we stayed there for, I think a year. It was at 19th street. It was a nice, nice ass place. But he got this uh, invitation to go to Portland. He said, would you be interested in going? I said, sure. So anyway, he had to make 
this guy looked like Colin Farrell. I mean, he's a really good yeah. looking guy, right? Yeah. And he was the kind of guy like if you went to the diner, yeah. all the waitresses would come over and hang out. Yeah. Right? You know what I mean? That kind it's of like shit. Kind of diner. Dude, yeah, uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you get that all the time, JP. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> My my question was my question was did you I don't just remember JP talking to anybody in Virginia Beach? Do you, Marty? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? Uh... <laughs> my question is: Do you just take off on a whim, or did you actually have a plan once you got to Oregon? Nope. What were you going to do? Well, I mean, they, she said they knew where on. they were going. They knew where they were going. There was See? girls there, right? There was girls, and that's all you needed. And, and they said, uh, come on out. We'll give you a place to stay. And, and we think it's really great out here. And they weren't asking <laughs> right. for any money. And, we're, and and she said, D said, you know, and you can bring your buddy if you have to. <laughs> right. the they obviously had yeah, read your book. <laughs> <laughs> Del Rio is like, we're giving each other high fives. And he goes, you're in. Yes. <laughs> So, so, so Marty, he didn't. Ha- he didn't have a. Fu- he didn't have a driver's license. Oh, oh my God. Well, let me. He was so what? weird. He was. Had so you weird. ever been out of the Maryland D.C. area? I uh, I had been to Arkansas and okay, back. Yeah, uncle and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. No, no, I hadn't been. Not been out so west. This was like a whole new world for you. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but. People used to do that in 1969. There was a lot of that, wasn't there? Yeah, and. Both of us had a had a little bit of. Um, mm, we needed to get away from some substances. We'll just leave it at that. Right. So this is a good opportunity to do that. So our first stop was to a hippie commune in rural Michigan, <laughs> and we stayed there for about two weeks until the shaking stopped. Okay. And then we then we got back into our. <coughs> dollar panel a conoline green van with no windows and we drove south it got so cold in the drive south that the accelerator stuck because of the ice <laughs> and i had to have del rio pull the accelerator back off the floor so we wouldn't crash oh my god we had ball tire oh, ball fact- tires back then it was always a, a wonder if your truck if your van would start every morning correct Oh, there was no inspections back then. <laughs> what did it start? You had to wonder what did it start. Uh, and and neither of us had any mechanical skills. That was not our forte. And we had uh, he had a little bit of money though. He had a little he had a little bit of dough. So we went from there. We stopped in Cincinnati at the no. We stopped in Dayton at the Dayton Art Institute. We had some good people there. Very cool. Uh, stayed a while there, then went to my people in Arkansas. We stayed there for a while, and then we went. Uh, let's see. Oh, you guys, you guys really took the roundabout way. Hey, well, we, knew, we we knew people. We knew people all yeah. along the way, right? And and a lot of cool people. And yeah, you know, straight we shot. just straight yeah. shot. You were going to Michigan down to Arkansas. Uh, we uh, again, we stopped in Dayton, right? Yeah. You, you know what I mean. And and like that, and then from there to Taos, yeah. and then out to uh, L.A. We spent some time in L.A. That was cool. Yeah. And up the the coastal highway there to San Francisco, and that's where we met D. So did you give D? That was a scene. You know what? That was a scene. That that was the week of Altamont, and they, oh. and they said, "Hey, do you want to go to Altamont?" Oh, okay. And I said, "I said." Nah, let's go to Oregon. Oh my God, that was the Altamont weekend. You would have been buddy. all right. You would have been all right now. Oh yeah, they, me and the Hell's Angels would have gotten along great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, the first night we got there, where Portland? Yeah, uh, no, in San Francisco. Uh, okay. I was expecting a. We were expecting a warm welcome from D. Well, apparently, uh, she's sharing the apartment with the boyfriend that she's going to leave. Mm to go live with Del Rio and somehow she's expecting that this guy's going to let him and I come in and sleep with them that night. I'm like, what? Free love, baby. <laughs> what? And Del Rio's like, I think I can talk my way through it. I said, I'm going to be in the van. I'm just going to sleep yeah. in the van. Yeah. 
So that that's he worked it out though. Uh, yeah, yeah, he did. He did, and she left with us, and off we off we went, and we ended up in Portland, yeah. and uh, that that that's when all the. Uh, what were you doing? Were you calling her and letting her know when you were going to arrive? You could email, you. text her, right? You'd be on the road for a couple. No, of days. I had no contact with her. Are you kidding no, me? Saying, when did she know you guys were coming? You just, I have no, I have no idea. I was between Del Rio and her. I, I you know, I was just a mind numb robot. Yeah, you were just kidding. <laughs> so, so Marty, you guys go up to uh, Portland, and those are friends of hers. Well, yeah, she uh, she 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 was a graduate student at Reed College, which is an exclusive okay. college out there. And her two roommates were like these equally voluptuous, you know, college right. Portlanders, and they just thought that Del Rio and I were like I don't know, like I don't know. Vikings arrived at the castle or something. It was great. All right. So, so this is where this is basically this is basically where you start the story at. So, yeah. Is, all right. So, so what happens at this house? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Oh, yeah. Nothing. Nothing. No. Hated by. Nothing happens at the house of apple cherry crispy bacon donuts at. Yeah. 6 a.m. with wine. So basically, you guys and just peyote. Kind of, you guys just kind of laid around and partied for about six weeks. Uh when they were home. <laughs> when they weren't home, we slept. Yeah. Next to the blazing fires in the in the big beanbag chairs. In, yeah. Yes. <laughs> in the no, that I had this this gigantic ancient sofa with these beautiful quilts. And that, and they had all this pre-cut firewood that you yeah. just would throw it on the fire and just sit in front of it. And it's like, and and they had like peyote. They were into peyote. They didn't like like whiskey, but peyote was okay. And we're like, all right. Oh. So, you know, it's just like uh, it so it led it led to nothingness. The first week you were good, <laughs> you know, and then the second week you were like. I probably need to get up and do something, but then you talked yourself out of it because you're being waited on hand and foot. And so it took you how long to realize you better get your ass back to the gym, you know? Uh, quite, a, quite a while. <laughs> Six weeks. <laughs> uh, even then, Del Rio's like, are you he's fucking like, stupid? I mean, like, why? G, G, I said, yeah, really. I mean, just just, just look around. And, and one of the gals was named... Elise, we will not later let him. He said, Elise has definite intentions toward you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, she's not really my type. And she goes, well, what, you know, what is your type? You know, like some tattooed stripper with one arm. I mean, you know, what? Right. You know, we're in Portland. Here we are, buddy. And I'm yeah, like, okay, 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 okay. Del Rio, we got to change. We got to change some shit. I mean, we just, this is not us right and he's like you you know he said you know <clears throat> we're in a gravy train with biscuit wheels and you bitch and bitch and bitch he said you're so stupid and i'm like <laughs> okay I, I you know okay all right so eventually i got it together and drove over to sam laprinzi's gym which i knew about before i mean that was one of the things ah, when we get to portland we're gonna go to sam laprinzi's gym and we're gonna ourselves into monsters bill Starr yeah. told you yep Bill Starr said, that is the place in Portland for an Olympic lifter. And you knew Patera was there. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, Patera came out of nowhere. You know, all of a sudden, there was this guy who uh, had been, I think he took, I think he took third at the Olympic trials with a 60, he was, he was like a good 65 foot shot putter. Mm, yeah. This was back in the days when the world record was like 70. Uh, but he didn't make the Olympic team. So all of a sudden he shifted from that into Olympic lifting and he came on really fast. And by November of 69, he had actually cleaned and stood up at 500. Right. Wow. In, Port in Portland. And he, you know, he somehow, I don't know if he went to Portland state. I mean, it was fuzzy as to, who he was affiliated with uh, 
but he trained at Sam Laprenzi's gym, and I got that. I got that actually from Star through Cassidy. And so when okay. we got there, I said, "How far is this place from where we live?" And they had this really nice uh, renovated townhouse in downtown Portland. We had to like you know get in the I don't know, it was like ten miles to southeast Portland. So I got there, and it was like it was a house in a suburban neighborhood and it looked nice. I mean, it was a nice neighborhood, clean. Everything was clean and crispy. And, you know, the Portland weather is just perfect. Just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful weather out there. And I really like the people. So I go inside and it's just perfect. The perfect inside homey, great gym. And they got a big, goddamn dude sitting at the desk and he's like hey buddy you know what i mean he's like friendly and i was like oh this is gonna be great and i look around they've got like squat racks and you know back then having a pull down machine was a big deal right yeah right or, or a bench that inclines wow they got a bench that inclines right so i went over to talk to the guy you know on we go and um you know I told him my credentials and i'm a serious guy and you know i'm not Okay. Too. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, and I, I, I looked okay. I was not. I was not in tip-top shape. Uh, and he said, you know, he's like looking at me. And he's going, well, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, you know, uh, Olympic lifting as of two weeks ago is banned. I was like, what? <laughs> what? Banned? Wait, we had like, on the moon by then, right? Yeah, was, I know. I mean, he's like Ken Patera trains here. What do you mean yeah, it's I'm banned? Saying, so, we make rubber plates back then. These no. No, yeah, yeah, not really. No, no. But no, no there were no rubber plates back yeah. then, and also dropping the weights from head height was considered really bad form. So right? you know what? You know why those guys had such big traps? They uh, were yeah. lower stuff. Yeah, low. yeah, because because they didn't throw away the negative, Jimmy. Yeah, they got mm. big as hell doing that, man. Yeah, but you know what? They don't need to press anymore. Right. Right. So that that kind of physique, I, I you know, I don't know. Uh, I got my eyes open to that. You know, maybe with a quick list, we don't need any negative. That's an interesting proposition. Yeah. Right. So, but with Patera, the problem was not necessarily that he was purposely uh, dropping these weights. Well, there was a twofold problem. The first problem was that the Sam lived above the gym. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well. Right, and uh, the second was that you know uh, Kenny was so strong yeah. that you know he's dropping three hundred, four hundred, five hundred from what he's six two. So you know what's that nine feet in the air? Mm -hmm. Right, and and again it's iron on plywood. Yeah, yeah. Right, and that's not, and it doesn't hit evenly. You know, it hits in the angle, it cuts into the boards, you got to replace this and that. And it's just, and Sam was like, every time, every time he drops it, it sounds like a hand grenade went off. I bet it does, man. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, that was the end of that. But, uh, well, anyway, the, I was so depressed. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I didn't want to get in the, in the truck and drive back to Lotus Land. He was like, oh, no, I don't want to drive back into the, you know to that velvet room. It's like that, a wolf. It's yeah, like, yeah. A wet, a wet room of velvet, a velvet, <laughs> a velvet rut. Velvet glove. <laughs> <laughs> a warm, wet velvet glove, right? Okay, with uh, perfect smells. So I said, now I'm going to walk around. And I, sm I had a smoked a joint. I walked around the neighborhood. No. And as it was a bright, sunny, beautiful day, and as luck would have it, there was a. Uh, one little beautiful house and it was just sitting there and it was a it had a for rent sign in the window and a guy was there cutting the grass and I said hey buddy what's going on with that and I looked like I don't know what I looked like I looked like one of the flying furry freak brothers at that time I was muscled up but I had a lot of hair I don't know like a, well, everybody did that, didn't they? Everybody. Uh, no, not necessarily back then. It was pretty clear. But, you know, Portland was a lot looser. Anyway, he 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 stopped and he came over and he said, yeah, yeah, this, this place is available. He said, 
he said, I've been trying to get it rented for a while, but I, you know, I'm like, great, great, this is great. So, uh, what, you know, what's the fee? He said, 75 bucks a month. I said, uh, okay, do we got to give you anything up front? He said, no, you can just uh, take it and give me the first 75 bucks and let's go. I said, I'm in, right? And we stayed there for two years. <laughs> I mean, did you get a job? I didn't have to. Okay, so your buddy Be- had money. No, because no. well, yeah, that too. But but no, he got a job. My mother died when I was young, and for some reason, for many many years, I got a check of like a hundred and twenty-five dollars a month. And and there you go, rent. That, but, that was but. it. Yep, that would cover. That would cover. You know, the rent, for sure, right? And then, you know, I pick up the rent, right? And then they pick yeah, up this and that. And I always had that that cooking ability, so it would allow me to kind of stay home and yeah. uh, so, do the Lord's work. So uh, we stayed there. We loved Portland. The only problem with Portland was that it was just um, ended up kind of a stagnation thing. What do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, we didn't run into Ken Patera, you know? I mean, it was just... Um, yeah, you missed them. What, uh, what? The energy of the city called us to. We had a lot of people saying, "Hey, man, you got to come back," you know. And this hey. is happening, and that was happening. There was a there was a live wire happening, a live wire scene happening back in. Yeah, DC. you went from the epicenter of whatever was happening that we're reading about in history books to you know to Portland, which wasn't happening back then. Yeah. No, and but then DC, they uh, a lot of guys that I grew up with were suddenly starting to get hot in the music business. Yeah, and they're calling me back and they're going, oh, "Come on back here," and I'm like, "Oh yeah, let's live some rock and roll lifestyle." Okay. But what, what, Marty? Where did you train for the the two years that you guys were there? And what happened with Patera? Did you ever hear? Oh, no, Kenny just disappeared. We didn't know what ha- what the hell happened to him from there. Right. Uh, as far as me, we got an uh, Olympic set that we have we had in a dirt cellar basement mm-hmm. with a seven foot ceiling. So, <laughs> was it a billard barbell? No, 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 no. We had a, we actually had a, uh, like an old Olympic with the big fat Olympic plates. Billard barbell, I remember that? Yeah, billard barbell. Uh, Bar- so- Bar- that's what Jimmy. I started with, Billard Barbell. Oh, right? yeah. JP, you got to get me. There's a pamphlet, a booklet from the 70s. It's Bill Grant, the bodybuilder, and Randy White, and they're doing the Billard Barbell exercises, and you get it when you buy the weight set. Mm-hmm. Now, see, I didn't buy it new. I bought it from a guy next door. This was in uh, this was in uh, Maryland. Whoa, 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 whoa. What are we going here? Go ahead. Listen, Go listen ahead. To yeah, let's guys. not get sidetracked. <laughs> <You guys. laughs> All ahead. right, back to Ken Patera. Willard Farmville. Oh, yeah. my God. We are a strain far afield, boys. All right, uh, so, all right. So you're there for two years. And then. Well, anyway, anyway, at that point, so that's the end of that part of it, right? Yeah. Uh, but in. In later, later years, um, thank you, uh, we pick it back up again, and there was this weird period where for several years in a row, the premier American powerlifting event was held at a, um, a racetrack casino in West Virginia. Yeah. Uh, do you remember that, Jim? Yeah, now, yeah, they did that for a while. That was when uh, yeah. Cohn did his USPF 1,000-something. Uh, no, 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 no. This was different. This was a guy named Nick Busick. Yeah, no, I remember. I mean, you know. And it, it, it was, it was a, uh, I can't remember what the how yeah. the deal worked. We had splintered off. But anyway, Eddie lifted, and, you know, it was a it was a big-time deal. A lot of good good guys lifted there. So, um one particular year we were there and Doug was there, Doug Furness, and, and he was in a good place. He looked good. Man, he had he had a, a rough period there. You know, he had gotten a, a horrible automobile accident with a bunch of professional wrestlers. Do you, do you guys know about that? I just just from reading your stuff about it. Yeah, yeah he was uh this is when he was in the the you know, the big time Vince McMahon circuit and 
he was with Sid Vicious and a bunch of those, you know, those top flight guys. And they were in a van and they were driving from uh, one location in Canada to another. And the driver, who was a professional wrestler, fell asleep at the wheel and drove them down in a ravine. And dog oh, man, he seriously, seriously hurt, like medevaced out and broken to pieces. Mm. And um, and he came he came back from that, and not like athletically, but I mean he came back from that as a human. So uh, he agreed to sit with us this year and and talk and he wanted, we were going to do an interview with him. I was with muscle and fitness magazine. <clears throat> so he came to the hotel room that Kirk and I were sharing and a bunch of guys got wind of the fact that, uh, Doug was coming over and we're going to do an interview. So all of a sudden we had about five extra guys show. Oh, Hey, what's going on? Just thought we'd drop. By. Oh, Oh, Hey, I know we'll just sit over here in the corner. We won't say shit. And, <laughs> So all of a sudden we had like nine guys. Doug was fine with it. He's like, you know, of course he, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he didn't anything, but he was in a good place. And we just talked and talked and we talked about training, we talked about a lot of stuff. And, um, at the end of it, he just got up and he walked out. And when he left, you could, and you could hear his footsteps walk down the hall. All of a sudden, everybody in the room, for some reason, started applauding. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's the top of the game. They were so they were so respectful. They were like yeah. so they were like, oh my god! It was like we just see Pavarotti give us a solo performance. <laughs> yeah. We can't believe it. And, it like, and you know, I tell you, it was uh, that was a, that was just that was a special thing. Well, they were smart enough to figure out what a privilege it was. Oh, uh, but we had you know we had yeah there was there was a, there was a lot of situations that we had like that back then. Well, you told me that. Even Cone, Cone looked up to Doug. Uh, yeah, Doug was, um, Eddie definitely looked at Doug as with, with equal eyes, and there was yeah. no one else that, but you know, I'll tell you this, as good as Doug was, you know what? Ed lifted better than him at uh, 50 pounds less body weight. Oh yeah, I mean, come on, it's Ed Cone. I mean, that's incredible. <laughs> I mean, that's incredible when yeah, you think still, about that 2,400 at 220. I've got two favorite powerlifting uh, stories. One is Kirk's 800 for five with just a belt. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank the you. The other one is Doug in Hawaii at the Record Breakers in, like, a bathing suit and flip-flops, squats 800 with barely any warm-up while everybody's just looking on in awe. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the money. That's the picture of you and Chalet. That's the same show. Yep. That's the same. That's meet? right. That's that's exactly the same day. Yeah. yeah. Um, Doug squatted nine eighty six that day, and I went <laughs> up to him and I said, "Why don't you do ten twenty five? And he goes, "I want to save it for the total." I said, "Okay." Yeah. And he bent six, and he and deadlifted eight fifteen. Oh my God! And ladies and gentlemen, the the. <laughs> The freaking equipment back then was not giving you much at all. I no, mean, and no one was taking this stuff serious. I think I told the story about this before the before this competition. Myself and Chalet got asked to breakfast by Ed Cohn and Doug Furness and their posse. So we went to uh, the second floor of Moose McGillicotti's in Maui. And we had a big table for like 10 and we're all sitting around in a circle and the lifting is supposed to begin at 10 o'clock and it's like 8 30 and mark chalet is is sitting to my left and he elbows with me and he like points at his watch and he goes we should be going they're supposed to start lifting at 10. <clears throat> and mark didn't want to say anything but i'm his coach so i'm supposed to say something so i look at doug and i said doug uh, the lifting's supposed to start at 10. It's 8.30. Shouldn't we be going? And he looks at me and he goes, don't worry about it. They won't start without us. <laughs> what he meant was to start. Yeah. Well, yeah. He's going to start with Cone. And and, and, then, and and then he finished the rest of his breakfast so slowly, so deliberately. Yeah. And then when he was done, he got up and he walked out. And you know what? When he walked in the door, everyone was like, Oh, now we can begin. Yeah, that's right. 
Right. All right. So then, how do yeah, you to- Patera. <laughs> Kenny. So we're at this uh, crazed uh, West Virginia uh, place, which is like a casino. Uh, they've got a racetrack. They're running a power, uh, a, a heavy duty powerlifting competition, and it, it's a nice location. They've got a a good venue. It's very open. It's like next to the right. racetrack, and it's 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 nice. Not a lot of people, but it's just it's nicely done. In addition, that night they have a UFC event mm. where Dan Severin, right? You know Dan Severin, right? Of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yep, fight, UFC, yeah. you know, UFC Hall of Fame guy, yeah, one of the tank. first wrestlers. I wish Tank would have fought him, though. That would have been great. Yeah, uh, that, would have, that would have been. But so Dan, Dan. Marty Stan's trying to stay on the subject. <laughs> Danny is on the meatball circuit, and he's going to fight a local guy here in West Virginia. And the kid's good, and I think he might have been connected with Dave Jeffries. Did you know Dave Jeffries? Dave Jeffries is married. USPF. No, who was that? Hello. Hello. Dave was Mary Jeffries' husband, anyway. USPF uh, president. Yeah, that's right. And Dave was a very good fight trainer. So anyway, so they got that going on. In addition to that, they have a shirted bench press extravaganza. All right. And they've got a bunch of guys that are attempting to bench 800 with a shirt, including Anthony Clark. To hear the phone number, press three. What is going on? What is going on? <laughs> Man. <laughs> we have editing ability. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, so anyway, we've got a bunch of these guys, right? Our bench, we've got the bench press extravaganza. So they've got a bunch of these guys that are trying to bench 800 with the shirt. And Randy Strassen is there of Milo Magazine. He's proud of me on he's, he's giving me beers. And I'm running up there and I'm going like, this is the greatest benching that has ever been seen in the face of the earth. And uh, like I kept going on and on and on. After that, after the fight, after the bench press, after the power lifting, we ended up in the bar. And at the bar was Ken freaking Fantana with his silver <laughs> hair. Patera. What did I say? Kenny Fantano. Okay. Kenny yeah. Patera. Finally, Thank Ken Patera. Thank you, Jimmy. Kenny Patera with his perfect, perfect hair. He had the, like a perfect silver pompadour. Now, wait, what, like, what year was this was again? Like a magnet. I, what you years? know, I am not sure. And I'm not. Don't taint it with the year. Okay. Yeah. You're slowing my roll here. Jimmy, straighten him out. He's well, I just long, man. because this quest started like in '69, so I want to see how far forward. Oh, there's a funny. big, there's a big ass yeah, make gap. Up a beat, Marty. This <laughs> is a, <laughs> this is a big ass gap. I mean, we're into the '90s. At okay. Least. Wow. Oh okay. no way! I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, we thought it was the '70s or something. Oh no! Oh God, you guys. All right. So <laughs> here's I the guess thing. not. I guess not with Dan Severin and all those guys. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, and, and Eddie is Eddie is at his his peak. He's lifting really, really well. And you know, Doug is looking good. There's no disintegration in, in his look. And you know, Kirk's there. Everybody's everybody's uh, everybody's on top of their game. It's a good time. Right. So what happens is that eventually this, uh, you know, again, it, it has to climax in some way, shape, or form. And Jim, as you know, uh, it, it, not all everything ends as it should. Right. You know, you just don't want to, you know, the... Kenny, that night was so yeah, but insightful. So, so, he was so, so smart. So, so, he was so he was so perfect. He was so board. all of it. And but but because I had so overindulged, I was cursed to this day by not remembering anything. 
and it haunts me. I mean, there I was. I was, you know, his silver countenance. He was super cool. cool. He was perfect. He was like a comic book hero, and he was smart. He did, and he was funny, and he was insightful, and he was, and he had all that incredible experience. And I wasted it all with my overindulgence. Well, you got an article out of it. Ah, you know, yeah, but you know, I mean, with, out with him. And the best thing was that he goes, "You're drinking with us tonight." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah. He knew, and, you know. The, you that. know what the best thing was? The best thing was he knew who I was. That's cool. He goes, "I know you." Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. That was the that that was the best thing. And again, uh, you know. <sighs> He had some rough patches after that, but yeah. I mean, this guy, what a specimen. Again, he kind of reminds me of Furness. I mean, this is a kid who, he starts off, uh, what's the story, Jimmy? His his older brother, Jack, was yeah, like coach. an NFL player. Seattle. Yeah, Seattle Seahawks coach. Uh, but I mean, uh, before that, he was a big time coach with what San Francisco was a linebacker coach. Yeah. I mean, and then he had, had another brother that played in the NFL also. 49ers. Yeah. Uh, no, Dennis. Jack, Jack was a legend. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Jack, Jack was Seattle. Jack was Seattle. Like yeah. Joe Gibbs was the Redskins or Parcells was the Giants. Yeah. That's a good dude. For sure. And so, so Ken came out of that, and <laughs> somebody is so popular. Uh, that wasn't me. That was that's Steel. Before. That was oh. you before. Oh, okay. All right. All right. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> well, anyway, the genetic whatever pool potency there was incredible. And in and, and, and the ease with which Ken shifted from, from football to basketball, then he broke his, broke his ankle to track and field, where, again, 65-plus shot putter. Yeah, ridiculous. Back in an era when 70 was, was the mark. Uh, yeah. And then to effortlessly shift into weightlifting and get so, so, so close. Yeah. To... Alexia, the best it's ever been. No one's ever set more Olympic left uh, weightlifting records than Alexia. Yeah, I believe it's eighty three or eighty seven. Next best I think is Ryder with like sixty two. Uh, but Patera was so close to beating him, and then to just effortlessly flow into pro wrestling, boom, just like that. Yeah, and. I was just uh, grateful to have those couple little glimpses, <laughs> right? Was that the first and the last time you ever talked to him? Yeah, uh, I had I had heard later uh, that he was an incredible recluse. Yeah, and he really Thought was. Like yeah, what what was the phrase that what, that it, we used? I can't even remember. Uh, doing a Gallagher. What is well, at the at the end, the uh, he was like the gregarious recluse or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He uh, that particular hermit. night. Hermit. He was a hermit. hermit. Yeah. Her, yeah. But that particular night, for whatever reason, he was just uh, you know outgoing and. Yeah, he was in uh, his element. Yeah, he was in his element, and it just you know, it was just a really special uh, night and time. I think yeah. that's enough, right? That's uh, awesome, man. Wait till you read the articles. It's fantastic. And yeah, yeah, it goes into a lot more detail in some uh, some aspects. Great article. Uh, you got some good damn details that are not in the article here, buddy. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, so both those uh, both those are on there, parts one and two. So they're up now. Just go to Iron Company and go to the uh, article section at the top of the site. Jim, and click on that. Yes. Jim, yes. What what do you take away from Patera? I mean. Have you looked at his training template? Have you seen? Yeah, I loved it. You talk about some minimalism. You know that that is the exact opposite of uh, some of those weightlifters who train, you know, four or five times a day with max attempts and all that. He he kept it so simple and got so strong. But was his rough 
I mean, he was like a bull. Yeah. Is that the way to go? Should we not reserve the bull for powerlifting and the subtlety for Olympic lifting? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? As far as his training template versus... No, I'm the- talking about philosophically. Yeah. Well, I mean, so here's the thing with weightlifting, and just in my experience, is it's such a technical sport yes. that, that you probably need some technique days in there also that don't crush your um, recovery abilities. Where in powerlifting, you know, once you learn those techniques, you're in a straight line. You know, squat bench and deadlift. So if you learn that skill, and then you have to worry about it takes us such a huge toll because you got to remember that weightlifting uses momentum, which doesn't tax you as much as the power lifts. You know, Partic- particularly if you discard the negative. Well, and that's the thing. Yeah, of course. Because just I was just going to say that, that you, yeah, you don't boom. get from squats from the concentric. You get from squats from the eccentric. Same with bench. Yeah. Okay. If you're doing uh, negatives and turning it around. You're going to get that too. So it's different <laughs> recovery ability, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, but I think Batera was caught halfway between two right. worlds. Yeah, yeah. It uh, was right. very impressive that he used like four exercises and was the second strongest man in the world. I mean, you know. Uh, but how much of that was attributable to his incredible genetics? Yeah, well, who knows? Who knows? Right. Because you, everybody, you know, you got a lot of guys with good genetics, but he obviously had the drive, determination, heart, soul, you know, that set him apart from everybody else. Because you, you all know guys with genetics that you passed. You know, you you deadlifted 750. There's guys that never got to the 700 because they weren't dedicated enough, but they had better genetics than you. Mm-hmm. So, or well, they I didn't. Think, yeah, or they didn't have proper coaching. Well, no, he deadlifted 750 on a lift he never practiced. I'm talking about you deadlifting 750. I'm talking oh, about Oh, yeah, your, but that was all genetics. that was all tricks and um, <laughs> yeah, okay. and mirrors technique and yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, that that yeah, that was not. That's that's not in the same category. No, I know, but I'm saying the genetic component of it. Oh, I'm a good example of the inferior genetics and exactly. superior techniques exactly. and Thank you. How subtlety can overcome uh, <clears throat> genetics and inferior uh, work ethic. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, guys, listen, I hate to be a buzzkill. We got such a, a great thing going here. It's meshing so well, but uh, we're at an hour here, so we better call it quits. Um, so anyway. So, yeah, so let me close it out by saying uh, check out Marty's weekly column and podcast, Raw with Marty Gallagher at ironcompany.com. Marty's also available for online training and seminars. You can reach him by going to our athletes page at ironcompany.com. Also pick up his book, Purposeful Primitive. It's a great read, a lot of helpful information. Uh, And you can also check out Iron Company for all your fitness equipment and gym flooring needs. And Jim, what do you got going on? Yeah, well, I don't. I'd have a little spot on Iron Company, don't I? You, you What's got, your topic, buddy? Yeah, you got a spot on there. Yeah, I wrote an article for them, and I'm gonna get another one coming out when what's, next week. Uh, what's gonna What's gonna be your podcast topic? Well, with with when I do, oh, next month. Yeah. Oh, I, I got no. You got to have one in your room. What are you gonna do this month? <laughs> yeah. No, this month. Yeah. You mean the the podcast that I'm gonna do? Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Well, when is uh, we'll figure it out. We got a couple All right. Of weeks. Well, then I'll, I'll have a. I'll, when you tell me when it is, I'll uh, have a sub. We're we're gonna launch tomorrow. Second, we're gonna you know launch what? your second article though. It's gonna be uh, in the next week or two that you All right. submitted. Jim, is tomorrow too soon? No, let's do it. <laughs> What'll it be on? It would be something about Maryland. I'm sure Maryland power of the way Maryland or are tougher. All roads no, lead to I, Maryland. The yeah. relationship between strength training and Goose hunting. That's it. And I went to Baltimore the other day to see the monster truck show. Oh. And I got Maryland Fox. <laughs> Maryland monster trucks and a Maryland tank top. So listen to this. Listen to this. So we're in, I'm, I'm sitting there in my, in my bedroom at night. And I said, honey, look, look. And I got my tank top. It's all Maryland flag. I look like the Maryland flag. And she looks at me. And she's always so nice to me. But she goes, you look 
ridiculous. <laughs> and all uh, Jim. They're like, you look great, Dad. Yeah, yeah. You know? Jim, look could I ask a favor? Sure. Could you shoot a picture of that and send it to me? Of course. Look, no, guys, this you. is this is bullshit. I'm going to hang up on you guys. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Talk to you later. I'd be, I'd be Bye. 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 Bye.